<clears throat> as I said, um, at this point, you want to obviously just uh, get into the slides for learning unit two. In other words, we just want to cover the theory to learning unit three. Sorry, learning unit three, not learning unit two. Okay. So now at this juncture, you've obviously finished uh, the content for your test one. All right. Um, do you guys know when your test run is? No, no. 14th. 14th April. Yeah. Okay, so you're all set to go in terms of studying for that. Okay. Obviously, if there's anything that you maybe have any difficulties with, just remember the YouTube channel is there. Everything that we've done up until this point, except for what we did in the first session today, is already uh, uploaded. Okay. And then, obviously, if you have any questions, um, you guys should have my email address. I don't know if you guys do, but you should have my email address. You can obviously email me. All right, please email me after you've actually tried. Okay, not just read the question, but actually tried. But that said, I know it's Friday, so I won't waste any more time. Unit three is managing working capital. All right, now. Uh, managing working capital as a financial manager is very, very important, okay? Um, why it's very, very important, all right? It has a direct influence on cash flow, okay? Now, I'm sure some of you have heard, cash flow is the blood of any business. Without it, businesses die, okay? All right, a business cannot buy new inventory for resale without, obviously, cash flow. And it cannot also pay its debts. It cannot pay its obligations, OK? Uh, the financial manager should balance current assets with current liabilities to ensure that the business makes the maximum amount of profit, OK? And we will touch more on that um, soon, OK? Now, the definition to working capital is it's basically the net difference between current assets and current liabilities, okay? That is the definition of uh, networking capital, all right? All right, current assets, I'm sure this is something we're all familiar with, okay? Uh, current assets are pretty much things that are either cash or near cash, all right? They will, we can turn them into cash sooner or should I say in less than 12 months, 12 months or less. That's why we call them current assets. So things like debtors, all right, that's why we call those current assets and things like obviously trading inventory, okay? Now, um, the reoccurring transition from cash to inventory to debtors and back to cash is called the cash cycle, okay? I know a lot of the time when we were touching on these subject matters, debtors, cash, and so forth, so forth, in other models, of course, we weren't really looking at it from the perspective of the cash cycle, all right? So in terms of the cash cycle, right, just to speak to it a little more, right, what happens in any business is the cash that we have, right, we use it to go and buy um, inventory, all right, the product that we plan to sell, okay? Um, and then when it's now in inventory, we obviously are selling it both for cash and on credit, okay? So that inventory then turns to debtors, all right? And then the debtors, hopefully, provided that they actually pay us, that then obviously turns back to cash. So that's just speaking to the cash cycle, okay? So that's what we mean by the cash cycle. First, we have cash in the business. That cash we use to buy inventory, that inventory obviously we sell to customers for either cash or on credit, all right? Therefore, we it, it, it turns uh, that inventory turns to debtors in a sense, and then turns back to cash, all right? Now, um, here they're just talking to the fact that when it comes to current assets, we want to turn current assets into cash as quickly as possible. Because remember, we want our business to be as liquid as possible. Now, why do we want our business to be as liquid as possible? When we're touching on uh, ratios and we're looking at the current ratio, remember the current ratio is current assets to current liabilities, right? And we also looked at the quick test asset ratio, all right? 
and that was also current assets minus your trading inventory uh, to your current liabilities, right? And that, once again, was a test of how liquid is the business, okay? Now, why do we want our business to be as liquid as possible? So that we can cover current liabilities, okay? We want to cover our obligations, okay? If a business is in e-liquid, then we're unable to cover our current liabilities, and that becomes a problem, okay? Because then what happens? We get people knocking on our premises door, wanting to collect our assets, okay? Whatever they can convert into value. So then we end up selling our non-current assets, things like vehicles, and things like machinery, the things we need to actually operate our business, okay? All right, right. So long-term assets are now being converted into cash, and that's a problem because at some point we're going to need them if we plan to continue uh, this business, okay? So obviously, um, managing working capital is imperative, okay? Now, just to speak more on that subject matter, when it comes to our current liabilities, our current liabilities are fairly predictable, all right? We, I know that I borrowed money from FNB, all right? The terms are obviously dictated, okay? You have um, taken 50,000 in terms of the overdraft. I know that I need to pay 10% of that every single month until it's paid off, okay? So that's predictable. If I get some uh, groceries, let's say I'm, I'm a grocery store, I'm smart, all right? I love using grocery stores because it's pretty straightforward and simple. I think you can all picture it in my mind. He's my supplier, all right? He's providing me with fruits, uh, whatever else I'm actually selling in my business on credit, okay? So I obviously have to pay him back. He's obviously going to dictate terms to me as to when I need to pay him. Can you see? In both scenarios, it's predictable. We know exactly how much I'm supposed to pay and when I'm supposed to pay to both parties. Does that make sense? However, when it comes to the other side of the coin, my debtors, the people who have actually bought from me on credit, and these days, believe it or not, well, I'm sure uh, we're quite familiar with this now, you can actually buy groceries on credit at Woolies. And I believe uh, Tick and Pay should also be able to do that if I'm not mistaken. Okay? Um, so yes, it's, 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 even in grocery stores, we have debtors. Is what I'm getting. Okay? So I have a debtor, all right? But I can't predict exactly when she should pay. Okay? Of course, you know, you structure an agreement over six months, but there's no 100% guarantee that she will pay. Just like there's no 100% guarantee that I'll pay my creditors as and when I should. Does that make sense? So, however, our current liabilities are very predictable. Our debtors, however, is not as predictable because we don't know their exact behavior. So the problem then lies in ensuring that we have enough current assets, in other words, cash, um, to pay off our current liabilities, okay? Right. Uh, the more predictable these cash flows, the less net working capital a firm needs. So the more predictable that I know that money's coming in, in other words, the less I need to actually hold cash in the business. Does that make sense? Because if I know for sure, okay, um, there's this money coming in and there's that money coming in, all right, then I know I'll be able to settle my uh, current liabilities. But the less I am sure about how much money is coming in, the more money I need to hold to ensure that I have enough liquidity to obviously get it to my expenditure, all right? Um, so there they just speak to exactly what I've just mentioned, okay? Um, now, here's the problem, all right? And we touched on, on this when we were also looking at, what did we call it? Solvency ratios. Solvency ratios, what were we assessing with solvency ratios again? Long term. Aha. And basically looking at how risky the business is. Okay, because the less 
the less we have funded the business with our own money, the more riskier the business is. All right, and we went into in depth as to why. Okay, so here, the more current assets that I have, or the more liquid I am, the less risk in the business. Okay, because basically I'm I'm hoarding cash, I'm holding on to cash, all right, and I'm not actually spending it on inventory that I can then potentially sell to clients, okay? So therefore, I'm actually losing out on money that I could potentially receive, okay? So can you see, playing it safe, yes, it reduces our risk, but at the same time, it also reduces return. I'm sure you guys are familiar with the term, uh, no risk, no reward, okay? Now I'm talking to a scenario where the less risk, the less reward, okay? All right, so obviously you need to play your cards based on on how 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 confident you are in being able to actually turn uh, your assets into uh, revenue, your current assets into revenue. Okay, um, but at the same time you can't be overconfident because then you run into the proverbial, and they mentioned it on this previous slide, liquidity trap. Okay. All right, so let's go on. All right, overtrading. Overtrading, this is where you're now in the liquidity trap, where I've taken all the cash that I had, and I said, you know what, forget about it. I'm going to invest in trading inventory. People are going to come and buy. And guess what happens? COVID strikes, and nobody's going anywhere. Now I'm stuck with this trading inventory. I have my obligations, but then I don't have cash to settle my obligation. Can you see? I'm now trapped, okay? Because I was over trading. I had invested too much in inventory and now I don't have cash to take care of my obligations, all right? Um, so here also now what they're talking to is the negative effect of over trading becomes worse when debtor's collection period exceeds the creditor's settlement period, okay? Now, because obviously my debtors are also facing a tough time as a result of the economic situation, they can't pay me as and when they should or as they used to, and therefore I have even less cash, okay, to settle my creditor settlement um, as and when they should be settled, okay? I'm sure we're all getting the picture now, right? Okay, right, and then here they're just talking more to it. it says, if this cash is not generated in time, then the business runs the risk of being illiquid. All right. Thus, the activity highlights the need for effective management of working capital and stresses the risk of overtrading. A business should only take on more debt if it will be able to settle these debts on time. And guys, in as much as you know, theoretically, we speak about how we should do this and we should do that, the reality is there is only so much we can do to kind of prevent risk, okay? There's only so much preparation that we can actually do. There's some things that just happen, much like um, the year that we had last year and what we obviously still going through uh, for the most part. These are things that nobody could have really anticipated, okay? Now, one way that can help us to prepare, however, is if we provide, if we prepare a schedule uh, of uh, budgeted receipts for debtors. Um, I've forgotten the other term we used to call this thing. But basically, it's a, it's a schedule that we prepare and it speaks to um, the total amounts of money that we expect to receive from our debtors uh, in every month, okay? So we know that this group of debtors took our stock from us on in January, okay? So they need to pay us in February, March, and April, okay? So we put in those amounts. We have another set of people who took money, oh sorry, who took stock from us in February. They need to pay us in at the end of February, March, and April, okay? And we obviously uh, calculate the total amount of money that we'll be receiving in February, March, and April, all right? And that then allows us to see, okay, we will have, or we should have approximately uh, so much cash to pay our 
uh, current liabilities and also fund other business activities. Okay, so that's what it's all about. Um, wondering if there's anything else I missed. Okay. Obviously, the only thing to highlight is that these schedules are just, um, yeah, in as much as um, they're not going to be 100% accurate because we can't predict that every single one of our debtors is going to pay us as and when. Okay, but I'm sure you guys managed to put that much together. Now, interest. I don't know if we spoke about interest in Learning Unit 1, about how it is the cost of money, okay? Okay, I think we did. I see two heads nodding. I'll take it. All right, cool. So, yes, it's the cost of money, all right? And obviously, um, the interest rate that's going to be dictated to you as a business is going to be based on uh, the amount of risk, um, the amount of perceived risk uh, towards you by the financial institution that obviously is assessing you, okay? Right, and then here they're just speaking to the fact, I'm sure we've all heard of the prime rate. I'm sure we've heard about it. We might not know exactly what it is, but I'm sure we've heard about it. And also the repo rate. Okay, the repo rate is set by the South African Reserve Bank. Okay, this is the main governing bank. Right? It, it monitors all the other banks, FNB, Standard Bank, APSA, Capitec, you name it, Time Bank, all of them are are, are monitored by the Reserve Bank, okay? So the Reserve Bank sets the repo rate. This is the borrowing rate between banks, okay? The borrowing rate between banks. Then what the bank does is it then puts an additional uh, rate called the prime rate, okay? And the prime rate is then higher than the repo rate. It's basically so that it can make a return on the money it borrows to us and to businesses, okay? That is basically the prime rate, okay? And it's obviously based on top of the repo rate, okay? So if the repo rate changes, that's obviously going to affect the prime rate, okay? If it drops or if it increases. I think there's been some talk about dropping interest rates. Have you guys heard about that on the radio? Something to that effect? Okay, they're talking about the repo rate and stuff like that. It, okay, let me not get into that because it's not relevant for you guys. Um, cost of money. Uh, bu, 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 bu. Okay, so here they're just talking to the fact that obviously as a business we want the lowest rates possible, all right, for ourselves, because then obviously that means it's less expensive for us to borrow money, okay? So when we borrow money, we obviously want to ensure that we are borrowing um, at the cheapest price possible. Um, so obviously, then it's also encouraging that we shop around. We check to see what others are offering. All right. Okay. Then the other thing they're speaking to there is you get different types of interest rates. You get an effective interest rate. You get a nominal rate. You get an average percentage rate. Okay. So the effective interest rate is somebody can quote you an interest rate of 10% per annum. Okay, and then someone can say, I want you to pay 10% um, in six months. Okay, now that 10% in six months is actually higher than the 10% over a year. Okay, because the period is shorter. Okay, so the effective rate of the 10% in six months will be higher. It could be 12%, it could be anything. I, I don't know the exact amount, but the only thing that I'm trying to point out is it could be higher. So that's the difference between the nominal and the effective interest rate. And then the average percentage rate, okay, that one is also uh, a special calculation that takes place. I don't know if we have it here. Do we have it in this slide? Okay. All right, so go through these. You'll find examples in your textbooks of them playing around with uh, nominal versus effective rate. When investors make decisions on interest-bearing assets, they should always base them on effective interest rates, okay? So you know exactly how much you're actually paying, okay? Usually banks actually, even with individuals, they tend to quote in the nominal interest rate. So it doesn't look as expensive as it actually is, 
okay? Um, but if you look at banks, they actually make a killing off of interest, all right? That's where their huge revenues come from, okay? Uh, the effective interest rate is the actual interest rate earned, assuming annual compounding, okay? Right? Compounding is a very powerful tool for wealth creation and depletion, all right? Depending on whether one owes or is owed money, okay? For those of you who, all right, um, may be interested in real estate, um, if you're to look at the amount of money that you pay on a house, right, over a 30-year or 20-year period, whatever period, you know, you plan to purchase it for, you'll actually see how much you actually pay in interest, okay? And that's where you begin to really see the effect of compounding and the effect of interest, all right? Um, particularly over time, all right? Uh, interest rates are quoted in a number of different ways. Sometimes the way a rate is quoted is the result of tradition, and sometimes it is the result of legislation. Unfortunately, there are times when rates are deliberately quoted in deceptive ways to mislead borrowers and investors. Okay, that's what I was talking about earlier, all right, where interest rates are quoted in such a way that it looks cheaper. All right. When is a rate not an effective rate? Okay. Okay. I think this will be the case when the rate is not actually compounded, but rather daily, weekly, monthly, or semi annually. Okay. So, in other words, like I gave the example when I said 10% over six months. Okay. But they haven't actually compounded, they haven't actually said uh, what that compounding is actually. Okay, all right, and there's just an example there for you. And then here they're telling you how you can actually calculate the effective annual rate, okay? So you use the nominal interest rate, okay? You can also use financial calculators for this. Unfortunately, you guys only use scientific. Um, they could actually ask you guys this as a question. So I think when we do our calculations, we will actually touch base on that. And then here we're just talking to the effective annual rate and the annual percentage rates, okay? All right, so we will look into this. I think it will make a whole lot more sense when we actually do an uh, exercise or two on it, all right? So here they're just speaking to the process, all right? The annual percentage rate is likely uh, to differ from the quoted rate as advertised by the lender. While there are several acceptable ways to calculate the exact APR, the general process is add the once of costs of the loan to the principal amount. The principal amount is basically, uh, if you go and you say, I'm buying a house for two million, okay? That's the principal amount, the two million, but in actuality, it's not just the two million that you're going to incur. You also have transfer duties and um, uh, legal costs and things to that effect. Okay, so basically they're saying those transfer duties, bond pay, uh, not bond payments, sorry, and those legal costs and whatever other associated costs you need to add that to the principal. The next step would then be to calculate the monthly payment for the new total. So not the bond payment that you pay on the two million, but the, 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 the two million plus those additional costs, okay? At the loan's effective rate, all right? Or the nominal rate compounded annually, okay? Then you need to calculate the interest rate that would have been applied, okay? So can you see that interest rate is gonna change because the amount is obviously now higher, okay? Right, and that is it for today. Are there any questions or thoughts? Yeah, well, don't you dare. <laughs> Are there any questions or thoughts? Everybody happy? Everybody ready to weekend? All right, guys, I'll see you when I see you. Enjoy the day. The only homework that I will give you is please go and read unit three. Uh, create formula sheets. 
Uh, and then if you have any questions, please.